Let's see here. Okay, just set record. Uh, I started the recording, Chris. Jennifer, you started the recording? Okay, great. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, um, we're going to get started now. And uh, I'd like to say thank you and welcome to everyone who's come to uh, participate in tonight's webinar. For any of you that don't know me, I'm Chris Wenzel, the current president of LIPG. And this is our 12th webinar. We're 12 for 12 in 2022. And really excited to uh, to have tonight. So I hope you enjoy the presentation. Uh, we're going to take care of a little business first. Just a little bit. OK, the first thing we want to do is thank our corporate sponsors. Um, we have two levels of corporate sponsorship at LIPG, Diamond Level and Topaz. Um, our Diamond Level sponsors are Cascade Environmental Drilling, PW Grocer. And our Topaz Level sponsors are Alpha Analytical, Virotrack, ERM Consulting and Engineering, Island Pump and Tank, Regenesis, VHB, Engineers, Scientists, Planners and Designers, and York Analytical Laboratories. If you're not familiar with any of these organizations, you can go to the LAPG website and there is a scrolling um, acknowledgement of our sponsors there. And you can click on their logo as it goes by and it'll take you right to their website. So I encourage you to visit our website anytime. There's usually some new content going up and uh, you should check it out. Okay, um, upcoming events, you know, during 2021, we had these Zoom webinars monthly, uh, generally the third Thursday of each month. And as I said, we're 12 for 12. Uh, we're looking for speakers though, because we don't have any for quarter one of 2022. So uh, if you have a presentation or some project or some topic that is related to environmental geology or science in general, um, we're always, uh, interested in having folks step up and be a presenter. Um, we had one field trip during 2021, and that was to the, uh, the Wilderness Breach in Fire Island um, back in November. And that's the breach that occurred during Superstorm Sandy. And it was a, it was a great trip. Um, we saw some really neat wildlife. We actually saw some whales, the snowy owl, um, seals, it was a good time and we're, we're working to plan field trips for 2022. Uh, we're always interested in having help um, people that have ideas. Um, you know, please step up, get in touch with us. You know, you can sponsor it, you can lead it, um, but we'd very much appreciate the help. And um, a recent survey that we did uh, clearly identified uh, the interest in the, in the membership to do trips on Long Island. So uh, please keep that in mind. The um, LIPG board of directors and officers meet monthly. Um, you know, as you've seen in our mission statements, we're an open organization. Everybody's welcome. Um, everybody's welcome at our board meetings. Uh, we meet right now still online. Um, the next one is on January 3rd, and we generally meet on the first Monday of every month. So if you're interested in getting involved or seeing what we do, um, get in touch. You can email us. Um, the uh, email address is right on our website and uh, we'll connect you with the right link and you can participate. So uh, we encourage everyone to get involved. <clears throat> um, just a little bit about, you know, in addition to the content that we're providing, um, our sister organizations have a lot going on also and, you know, similar programs into what we have. So there's a lot of good, good um, presentations and work going on out there. A little bit about the New York State Council, just an update. Um, they're moving forward with being approved to provide um, and facilitate continuing education for professional geologists in New York State. You'll see a lot more about that coming out um, during 2022. Uh, the council will get underway with sponsoring programs, approving programs and sponsoring them so that folks can participate and get their professional continuing education credits that they need. There's also, you're going to see an announcement about a fundraising that the council is doing, um, and it's the second annual um, beer batch fundraising effort that Lithology Brewing in uh, Farmingdale is uh, currently finishing the uh, fermentation pad 
uh, packaging process. And uh, the beer this year is called Pleistocene Pilsner, and it will become available uh, for those who are interested. And, uh, uh, you know, Lithology makes a very good beer. So, um, you know, I went around the horn and looked at other, other sister organizations across the state, Buffalo, uh, Central New York, Hudson Mohawk, and uh, the Eastern, um, Eastern Division of the AIPG. And, you know, it's the end of the year, so most organizations really don't have anything else going on in December um, or really that much booked for, for January right now. I will tell you that Central New York, if you visit their website, you'll see they have speakers booked on a monthly basis through May already. So, you know, check their websites out, see what they're up to, but they uh, generally have good presentations and good content also. Um, those of you who participated before has seen that, you know, the Pennsylvania Council of Professional Geologists is a very active organization and they've, um, they've got some presentations and webinars going on scheduled right now. There's two in January, um, one about, you know, carbon um, continuous usage and storage and um, uh, the voluntary cleanup program in Pennsylvania. Then there's something in March about hydrostructural methods and bedrock, you know, act for characterization. And there's a all day program for um, borehole geophysics in April that you can sign up for. They're pay, they're pay events, but um, they can be very good also. There's a reminder here for those of you who are um, advancing in your careers, um, if you wanna become a New York State licensed professional geologist, you do need to pass both uh, portions of the ASBOG exam, uh, the fundamentals and the professional batteries. Um, right here, we've got the, uh, the test dates and the deadlines coming up for them for 2022 and 2023. So make a note of that. And um, if you're interested in doing that, I would encourage you to begin to prepare your applications because there is a certain amount of content that needs to go in there to document your experience, to demonstrate your, um, your um, ability to take the exam qualifications to be approved to take this exam. Okay, so uh, one special thing we wanna talk about here in April of 2022, will be the 29th conference on Long Island, uh, Geology of Long Island Metropolitan New York. That's something that uh, our featured speaker tonight, Dr. Hansen has uh, facilitated for all these years. And I, um, I myself have, have attended probably half of them uh, in, the, in that time. And I've always found them to be fantastic. You know, they're looking for, um, uh, papers and participants, and I would encourage everyone uh, to take the time on a Saturday to get involved. Um, good stuff. Presentations generally are short with a QA and a um, portion of it, and that keeps it moving really nicely. Um, you don't get bogged down on any one thing, and there's, it allows for a lot more um, content and uh, variety in the presentations that are made. So, um, you know, keep that in mind. It's always a good time. And enough of me, and we're gonna to get to the main event tonight. Um, presentation is on Long Island uh, Glacial Tunnel Valleys. And um, the presenter tonight is Dr. Gil Hansen, who uh, we all know and love very much. And we're very, very excited and, and pleased to have you here, Gil. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing and allow you to share your presentation and take it away. that. Thank you very much, Chris. Yep. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be uh, presenting, a, presenting the LAAPG. It's a, I think it's a fantastic uh, organization. And uh, today I wanted to talk about something that maybe most of you know a lot about, but uh, maybe you don't. So, uh, talk about tunnel valleys on Long Island. And uh, oh. uh, yeah, I have to get it up here. Tunnel valleys on Long Island. 
And I'm going to suggest that all of these features here are tunnel valleys formed during the last glacial maximum. And uh, I'll give a little bit of a reasoning for it. And then uh, hear what you might think. When I arrived in uh, Long Island in 1966 uh, to become a professor of geology at Stony Brook University, I was quite intrigued by the fact that there are all these valleys and hills and then harbors. And, uh, and it was quite interesting. And I used to, I still, I still do, but I'm retired. Um, dive from Stony Brook, you got the Earth and Space Science Building here at Stony Brook, and then get up onto Nichols, then out onto 25A. You can see it's going across all sorts of valleys and ridges, and then down Port Jefferson, and then across to uh, East Broadway here to my home. And uh, I thought that was quite interesting that this was such a steep uh, road. It's a uh, road that's built right onto the wall of this valley. And uh, this would be the this would be the uh, the wall. And uh, I was particularly interested because I'm fr uh, from uh, from Minnesota, and uh, I like winter. I probably liked it much more than I do now. I like snow. And I found driving in snow a challenge because in Minnesota, you got to drive in snow from usually from mid November to mid March. It's not that way anymore, but it was then. And so uh, you got used to it. And uh, you quite often were driving on roads that were not plowed very well or plowed at all. And so at uh, Stony Brook, quite often, there'd be a day storm and then uh they're, they'd announce you know that that's that's really bad out there and then people in the uh in our department many of them would just say i gotta go home now and uh i didn't i i, I wanted to wait till it was over so i didn't have to ride it in the crush and so i would uh wait till later on and then driving down 25a was pretty good they would usually have it uh, plowed and sanded, and you could go this way and then uh, get to my home uh, on, on this road here, North Country Road, and then up here and around. But I wanted to challenge the East Broadway Hill. And uh, I guess there was a little bit of a spirit in me of the hill climb in 1910. They had a big hill climb on uh, on Long Island and, and, and Port Jefferson, and they had 60 some cars racing one at a time up the hill to see who got the better. I think the 20 seconds was a was a record. You could see it was a very popular event. People sitting along here, people sitting along here, all watching the hill. So I guess maybe I had a little bit of that spirit in me. And this would be what the hill would be like. This would be down uh, just as you came off of 25A, turning onto East Broadway, going into East Broadway. And I found, I found that uh, if I could get the car, this is Main, uh, East Main Street, if I could get the car speed up to more than 30 miles an hour, don't tell the don't anybody know I said that, right? <laughs> I think it's illegal, but uh, you had to get up to 30 miles an hour and then you went up the hill. And then it was usually not plowed very well. So it's a town, it's a city, I think, I think it's a city road. And uh, it wouldn't be any much sand or, or, or salt on it. And so it'd be just cars that would be, I've, I've gone through it alone. So if there weren't too many cars and I got my speed up to, to 30 miles an hour, I could just take up and go up here. But sometimes it would be difficult. This was this part right in here, where it was, it was, I remember 
it was rough because it was a big change there. And then if you didn't make it all the way up, uh, before I, the car would stall, I would turn and make a U-turn and then go back up again and try it again. I thought it was quite good. And if, it, and if I didn't make it, then I would go back all the way back to North Country Road and then home. Because even though this was uh, uphill also, it was only seven, a 7% 7 grade at the worst. So I, I was not very, I, I was interested in the geology of Long Island, but I didn't have time to spend any thinking at all about it. And then in the 1990s, uh, when I reached the age of 60-ish, I decided that I should really take some time off, not just spend time everywhere else in the world looking at uh, rocks uh, and, and think a little bit about geomorphology. At about the same time, DEMs came out. And this is a DEM here, and uh, digital elevation model. And with the digital elevation model, it, it allow you to see things very, very well. And so uh, it's not surprising them that I think first thing I wanted to look at is, uh, what's this wall? What is the wall? What is the harbor? And why, why is this steep hill here? Why is there a steep hill? So we'll talk a little bit about that today. So. Uh, students have, uh, who use DEMs to study North Shore Tunnel Valleys. Uh, Valdemar Poholik and Daniel Mulch uh, did some studies uh, up to 20 years ago now. Uh, and and, and uh, I, I teach a course for earth science students to do research. And I intended to do in the summer of 2020 to do research on uh, Carolina Bays and the Pebbly Lewis, you may have heard of, I was kind of interested in that, which required going out and collecting samples and analyzing them. But COVID-19 came up and uh, the university said, students cannot go outside. They cannot, they cannot do collect samples outside. So I decided, why don't we look at Long Island uh, DEMs and then have students analyze, analyze the DEMs different aspects of it. And these students, Dan, Matthew Antis, Jake Kaiser, Luciana Lombardo, Vincent Simonati, and Chalman, all, all decided they want to be, be interested in the tunnel valleys. So what will we consider? Um, we'll look at the tunnel valleys, which are candidates, uh, candidates on Long Island, or can, and then uh, global subglacial streams and val tunnel valleys. How tunnel valleys form, characteristics of tunnel valleys, uh, Laurentide subglacial rivers as source of water for Long Island tunnel valleys, how might Port Jefferson tunnel valley have formed, uh, possible older tunnel valleys. So these are the, like I said before, these are what we're going to consider uh, as look, looking at as do these have the characteristics of tunnel valleys. And uh, we'll go through uh, some of the, the characteristics and talk about what we see here. Uh, but we'll first uh, go through global subglacial streams and tunnel valleys. Uh, it's probably, I, I don't remember how many years, 30 years or so ago, then they, they realized that there are lakes and then rivers under the Antarctic ice sheet. And you think you, it, the temperatures are, mean annual temperatures on, uh, on uh, Antarctica are minus, I don't know, 40, 50, 60, even 80 degrees centigrade. Uh, the mean annual temperatures, most, I don't know if there's anything why it was minus 10, but anyway, uh, and they, they, can, they can tell now from uh, rate, I guess they, they use, uh, some kind of radar or something, they can do it. And they, they can identify it. And here's a big lake, a little bit smaller than Lake Erie, Lake Vostok. That's one where they spot it to the emphasis. And you can see that, that this, this tells you that, that under this 2,000 meter thick ice sheet, uh, there's water. 
the bottom of the glacier is wet. So it's a it's a it's a wet it's a wet bottom glacier, and so uh, the, the the geothermal heat that's coming up through the earth is heating up to the uh, to the area is heating this area enough so that you get water and that water has to get away and you can see the water is full and it actually you can see the dendritic patterns and everything and they're all flowing in in the case of antarctica to the ocean around them and they're and they're big rivers not little tiny ones and then here's a, a model of what they think that the that the subglacial lake subglacial streams looked at on this uh, on the Laurentide Laurentide uh, glacier, and here you can see uh, in this case we have a uh, one uh, one area you can see the dendritic patterns they're all heading here and they're heading out into the ocean same thing here same thing here so in out of here they're going out on, onto land so. We're getting melting everywhere, and that water has to get out, and it, for, it forms in, in rivers. And then if we look closely here, you can see that uh, there's one little river that's coming down onto Long Island. So it's supplying water that's draining from uh, all over the area. Then if we look at... Uh, Tunnel Valley, where tunnel valleys are on the, on the front of the Wisconsin and ice sheet, you can see these are these are the, the moraines, and you're gonna you get tunnel valleys that are of course perpendicular to it because the water that's you know, that's forming on a, on the lake or on the ice and, and at the bottom of the ice has to get out and it's coming out and it's coming out usually in tunnel valleys that are perpendicular to the moraine front. And uh, you can see then that uh, here's one, and then as a glacier retreats, you get, you can see they, they, uh, they, they continually are at the front of the glacier. As the glacier retreats, you get new tunnel valleys. So the, these are not unusual. These are, are, are very typical. Now, how tunnel valleys form? So first is, what are the source of subglacial water? Melting at the base of the glacier by Earth's internal heat is one source. Another one is melting at the base due to friction as the glacier flows. And then meltwater from the surface that flows through moorlands to the base. And this is a major source in the summer, because in the summer, uh, especially at, at latitudes like near Long Island, the sun was shining as bright then as it is now roughly, only, only a little bit less bright. Uh, so Lumina, it was very, very, uh, a, lot of a lot of energy was being put into it. So there was a lot of water that was available. And so here'd be uh, Greenland, and this would be a meltwater lake. And, and I, I tried to find lakes that had scale on them, but I, I usually couldn't. I couldn't find any that were good. And but you can see it's it's a lake, and it's here's a stream. Now, this, the streams are heading off the glacier. They want to get off the glacier. Now, what they do is they usually travel into what's called a moulin. M O U L I N. Uh, and, uh, and they're pouring at huge, tremendous rates down these valleys into these. And usually the uh, lands form where you get crevasses cross-cutting, and then uh, that forms a weak spot, and then the ice goes, the water goes down, and then um, it causes this feature. And here's a picture of a, a guy climbing down into the Milan. Uh, I don't know why he's climbing down, but he's climbing down, and you can see it's a fairly large feature, and uh, you can see the walls are scalloped. So the water at some time was coming down very rapidly, and uh, and, and selectively uh, 
eroding the, the ice. Now it goes down and then it goes into subglacial tunnels. And here's a subglacial tunnel in Russia. This is, uh, this is rather typical of a picture of one. Uh, and, and there are quite a few pictures on subglacial tunnels. You might want to look at them. I took this one because it's this guy's got a really nice light and you can see things very well. And uh, you'll notice that the walls are scalloped. And that scalloping is probably there because it's turbulent water and the water is forming eddies and continually uh, eroding, selectively eroding the ice at different places. So that means the water has to be traveling relatively fast. And, uh, and uh, you also can get a feeling for the speed that water was probably traveling by the size of the boulders that, the, that were left behind. And probably much of the finer material was carried with the, uh, with the water. And so here is a model of how, how the water might come down. I have a hand model I can I usually show, uh, and because a lot of people are wonder how can how can water flow uphill? You guys probably won't have any trouble with it because you understand potentiometric surfaces and things like that. Uh, uh, but a lot of people, well, I'm, I'm, I, when I'm talking to them, they say uh, they don't understand that. But in this case, you can see this is the potentiometric surface. The glacier ice is, is impermeable. And then you have, of course, fractures in the ice. Uh, so you'd have water going up into this, up to these sort of levels. And of course, uh, the water is going to want to flow down potentiometric surface, which in this case ends up being uphill. And uh, this is just to, be, to give you a nice view of what would be happening. So, you drop something in the in this water, it goes down, down, and then when it hits here, it doesn't go to flow downhill. It starts flowing uphill, goes uphill, and then out. And so this is how you get water to flow flow uphill. Uh, then, how how do you get tunnel valleys to form large tunnels to form large valleys. Because that's a, pr a problem because some of these valleys are going to be on the order of a mile wide or so. Uh, and so one of the ways is, is that the tunnel, tunnels can't be very large. They can't, I don't know what this, the maximum size is, let's say maybe 30, 40 feet. Uh, if they get much larger than that, the ice, the, the high pressure of the ice is going to just collapse the, the tunnel. Uh, and so the idea here is that the tunnel just sweeps back and forth, uh, in which case then uh, afterwards you can get a fairly wide tunnel, even though the, uh, you can get a fairly wide valley, even though the tunnel itself isn't all that large. Another model is that uh, when you have these tunnels, you're at the, you're having a wet bottom uh, glacier, and uh, and if there's sediments in it, to be the case like on Long Island, the, uh, the water is going to, uh, the, the sediments are going to be filled with water. Uh, they're going to be uh, saturated. And that water is going to want to go to this area, which will have a lower potential, potential metrics uh, value. And so it's going to come in here. And then you're just going to have this uh, erosion or erosion causing because the sediments in here are going in with the water and then being carried away. So this is another way. And these are just two, two models of how, how wide tunnel valleys can form from a small tunnel. So let's look at the characteristics of tunnel valleys compared to North Shore valleys. Uh, First of all, they're usually U-shaped depressions with steep, often asymmetric sides. So we're going to look here at the Cold Spring Harbor. 
right there. And this is, I, I, I cho chose this because it, 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 it's a small area. And you can see it's more or less U shape, 20 degree or 36% slopes. And you can look at the others, you can do a DEMs, check them yourself, see what they're like. Uh, straight individual segments independent of each other. And that's what we see here. And lots of them, and not of them, all of them are with water. You can see they're all through here. Some of them are there, 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 there. I don't, I don't know what happens in Smithtown, in Stony Brook Carver, and then Port Jefferson. Uh, so that's rather typical of, uh, of, uh, of them. They lack tributaries. So if they're, if they're going, to, if they really uh, were a stream formed by streams flowing to the north, you'd expect them to be dendritic sort of patterns. But we don't see many tributaries at all on here. If there are any tributaries, they uh, don't have a typical tributary uh, pattern. So, and they don't have any drainage basins. You don't, you don't see any drainage basins. So that that may, that gives you the clue that they're not they're not uh, subaerial. They're subglacial. And may, valleys may be sinuous in forming and astomosing. Uh, patterns here. Uh, in this case, now you can see here uh, is in uh, the Stony Brook Port Jefferson area. This is really different. It's the only place there is, and this is a, this is what an anastomosing pattern looks like, and this is what we have here. So they're anastomosing, uh, and so they're they're cutting across each other in some cases. Uh, they terminate in outwash fans, and you can see Port Jefferson is a, a good example here. You can see here's an outwash fan, and uh, so that and, and the glacier, uh, the the, the, um, the, uh, the end of the tunnel valley is right there at the at this part. We'll take a closer look at it. You can see others. Here's a tunnel valley. Uh, you know, this is a, uh, this is an outwash fan, and probably was formed earlier. But then afterwards, the glacier or the the water in the tunnel valley decides to erode it rather than deposit sand. Uh, in some cases, you don't see uh, much many features at all, and they go uphill and downhill. Uh, I don't see many uh, cases where they they go downhill under the water, but there is one here on. If, if you're going to Stony Brook University, this is 25A here. If you look, if you could, if you know, if you think about it, when you're driving to 25A and out to, to Nichols Road, uh, you see you're going uphill, uphill, uphill. And then when you get to the railway station, you'll notice you're going downhill again. But it's not a big deal, but they, they can go uphill and downhill because they're, they're not controlled by uh, uh, gravity. They're controlled by uh, uh, the, 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 the hydraulic head, and these are this. And tunnel valleys typically form where the ice margin was frozen to the bed, and uh, and that's that's an important thing to realize. So that uh, and, and frozen to the bed means that there's permafrost. And I just take a look. Oh, here's some more. Some valleys in that Harbor Hill Moraine. And uh, you don't see much of a valley afterwards. Uh, but some continue south, because here you can see a, a, a stream coming out, flowing down the outwash plain. So it's coming uphill here and then flowing out. Uh, this is another case, one uphill and then flowing out. Uh, uphill, flowing out. Uh, they're not, there are several cases like that. Some places uh, you can't see much of a stream afterwards. As they continue south, they may erode the outwash plain. You can see that right here uh, and here. 
uh, may have outwash fans at the southern edge of the Harbor Hill Moraine. And uh, we've seen that. Most have a north-south trend. And that is they're, they're, uh, they're perpendicular to the front of the glacier. They are wider at the northern side of the island, often forming bays. And they uh, become narrow as they approach the Harbor Hill Moraine. And that's what we're suggesting is they're getting narrow because they're running into permafrost. And uh, water, and uh, water especially when it's running, is going to have a hard time uh, uh, mining, quarrying uh, permafrost. It's quite resistant. And so then the, the, waters, uh, the water doesn't, the, the tunnel doesn't form a wide valley. And if there are tributaries, they're short and perpendicular to the trend of the valley. And let me see if I can find some for you here. Uh, here are some, here are some. Uh, some of them aren't exactly perpendicular. Here's one. I don't know what this is at uh, Lloyd's Neck. Uh, here's some, here's some. Uh, there aren't many tributary tributaries, but if they are, uh, they're not, a, they're not a simple pattern. The slope of the valley valleys also become steeper as they approach the moraine. And so we'll take a look here. Uh, I think this is Hempstead Harbor. No, uh, that's Cold Spring Harbor. Oh, you guys know better. I don't know an answer that well. And, and here uh, we can see as you're going up here uh, in the harbor area, it, the bottom of the harbor is pretty flat. You go up, you see that the, that the, the uh, until you get to the front of the glacier, there's a, a slope. And then once you reach the top, then the water is coming out and forming then uh, a stream a valley on the, uh, on the outwash plain there. So uh, just to discuss why we might have had uh, permafrost. And uh, at the maximum, last glacial maximum 21,000 years ago, this number keeps changing because we're getting better numbers. It used to be always 18, now it's 21. The Long Island was uh, about 70 miles from the uh, shoreline at that time. And this area would be considered then a polar desert or a tundra. And uh, just ignore the phone. <laughs> and, and, uh, and the temperatures here were quite cold because when the glacier was right here, uh, you had a lot of cold winds coming down, cold winds coming down off the, off the glacier uh, through here. And uh, so we had low temperatures. And the temperature was, uh, they think, at the time of the, the glaciation, was about minus 10 degrees centigrade. That was the mean annual temperature here which is in Fahrenheit, 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Think now, how often does the temperature on Long Island get to 14 now? <laughs> and then 14 was the average. That meant about half the time, the temperatures were above 14, but about half the time they were below 14. And that meant you got the, the, uh, the, the uh, get the ground frozen and, uh, and and when that happens then you get permafrost and that permafrost soil is uh, really resistant and in fact it, the glacier has a hard time handling it and so now what you'll see is in that case then is that uh, the, the ice uh, can't, is pushing against it but in the part what is happening is the ice going up over the over the uh, over the uh, moraine, and water is coming down and flowing up the hill here. 
and then going out onto the outwash fan, outwash plane. So when you're driving along North Shore, how would you identify a tunnel valley? And uh, that's what people ask me usually. So I, I just take one example. And here's 25A. Some of you probably have been there a number of times. And uh, this is the main street. This is 25A, 25A. And you're going up here. And I got just a picture. And, and this is a, uh, a, a case of a, 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 a special case. And when you're doing it, you, you'll see you're going uphill. You look to your left, you'll see there's a wall. You look to the right, there's a wall. Those are valley walls. And they don't necessarily have to be this close. They could be, they could be a half a mile apart or something. But if you look carefully, you'll notice them. And then, uh, then, then uh, they're going on. And, and the reason I say roads, because many of the roads are built, of course, in the tunnel valleys because it makes it easier to go across this rugged terrain. Uh, and so uh, you be on the watch. And I know usually after I give a talk, somebody will say, oh, I, they'll, they'll actually see me later and say, I didn't know it. I live in a tunnel valley or I go to work. When I go to work, I go through a tunnel valley. <laughs> so let's consider then the Laurentide Subglacial River as a possible source of water. And uh, so this is the possible stream that's coming down that could have been water. And you can see that even though this is a small area, that could be a, a significant more amount of water that's being added to the water that's forming from melting of the surface uh, as well. Here it is coming down. And I'm not sure if they have the location right, but. The only place I could see it is that the Quinnipiac River looks like it's a possible one. And so this could be then where the river is coming down. And then when it comes out onto, onto uh, the, the, the uh, sound area, uh, it's starting to erode. So the thickness of the sediments, glacial sediments, are based on seismic studies. And these are sort of studies. So you get the really dark ones are 600 feet thick, 500 to 600 feet thick. So they're really quite deep. And so you can see that this is a very deep valley and it's coming down. And it looks like uh, most of the water is coming down here and is escaping uh, to the front of the glacier in this area right here. Uh, it's not it's not coming down here or here or here. Very little would be. And so we can see that that's a valley. Uh, that, that's a that's probably a tunnel, that's a tunnel valley there. You can actually see these valleys that extend out into the sound right here. And there's actually one uh, coming that way. And then this uh, Stony Brook, this is, the, this is the Stony Brook area. It looks like there could be a lot of water coming down that way. Uh, and then down, coming down through Mount Sinai, there also could be a lot of water. What's really interesting is that it doesn't look like there's much coming out of Port Jefferson, coming water coming into Port Jefferson, uh, even though Port Jefferson is the this nice harbor here. Uh, it, it could be that with all this water, this is the reason we have the, uh, the special terrain uh, that we have in this area that's causing something, uh, causing us to uh, okay. So so how might the Port Jefferson Tunnel Valley have formed? Okay, here we have Port Jefferson uh, Harbor. Here's the Mount Sinai Harbor. Here is the Interlobate Moraine. The, uh, this is the Beltaire area. 
So you know, low gate moraine. This is the Roanoke Point moraine. Uh, this is the Stony Brook moraine. These are names that were given by uh, oh, I forget now it's Sid. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm getting old. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, we take a look at how this happens. You can see we got Port Jefferson Harbor. We got this narrow valley coming here. And then you can see we get this large outwash fan. That's a lot of sand that was kind of sand and gravel that was brought down there. What's also interesting is that you don't see any streams that are coming out from Port Jefferson, suggesting then that you had really large quantities of sand being deposited in many rapid water and then stop. So you didn't have dribbles coming out later to give you fan, giving you a stream, streams touring valleys. You're getting valleys forming from later streams, but not at the time. And uh, so this would be the Stony Brook sublobe. That would have been there, and that would have been the Roanoke Point sublobe. And I was talking to some other geologists, and uh, they said that's a perfect place to get a, uh, a large amount of water, uh, get a large amount of water uh, funneling through. So this would be the model. Uh, you have the Ronkonkoma moraine. And then a glacier is retreated. You have a proglacial lake that formed between the, uh, the, the glacier and the Ronkonka uh, moraine. And this is suggested by what's a feature known as the Smithtown clay. Some of you know about the Smithtown clay. And uh, it's, it's at about sea level uh, uh, below the sediments. Uh, and then uh, the glacier is going to advance and form then the Roanoke Point Moraine and then the Stony Brook Moraine. And then some events, and, and the big question is how many events? Uh, it's probably more than one event because uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of sand and gravel brought out uh, that came up through the area. And the fan has more sediment that has been removed from the tunnel valley. And we didn't underst don't understand it. There's much more sediment in the, in the fan. And uh, so we thought that we, if we went to the north, uh, we'd see a, a large amount of, of uh, a, a larger tunnel there, another tunnel there. I'm sorry, another big valley there, but we don't we don't see any. So uh, I, I like to go on uh, field trips to Long uh, to Port Jefferson, and uh, probably if uh, if I were up to it, I would have done this as a one of the field trips. I was asked I could either give a talk or, or a field trip. So part of the field trip would be this, and uh, I'm, I'm putting this in here just to say a show. Uh, what would the water be like? I like people, I tend to do it when I'm driving, not all the time, but quite often I'm driving along and, 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 and if I'm in a tunnel valley, I'm saying, oh, I'm, I'm in a tunnel valley and I'm driving along with the water and uh, going along. And so uh, we're gonna follow the uh, path of the water uh, that we go up to the north, south, to the, under the, to, to the railroad tracks, uh, and the water was traveling uphill at the base of the glacier. And then at the front of the glacier is at the railroad tracks. And so we're gonna, we're gonna watch that. So just pretend now you're, you're in your vehicle and you, if you go to Port Jefferson ever, and you're heading south, you're going up 25A. And uh, we're gonna go here. We're starting uh, uh, here at, the, at more or less the base. And then we're going to go right here and then uh, we'll take a look at uh, the tunnel, what's happening at the, uh, at, the, at the railroad track. That's the railroad track. And, and think about what's happening. So 
when you start out, uh, you're going to have a 4% slope roughly. And as we get closer to the front, the slope becomes 7%. Then when we get to the railroad track, you can see the slope is much less. In fact, it's actually, it's actually sloping to the, to the south. Uh, or down to the south. This is going up to the south. So here we are heading up. Heading up. You can actually see the change in slope here. And some of you have seen this nice boulder, which somebody tried to destroy but was un unable to, thankfully. Now the slope is 7%. We're now at sheep pasture road. You can see it's less steep now. And then uh, less steep, uh, almost flat. And then if we're at the railroad track, you can see if we look to the south that it's a slight deep, slope is slightly to, down to the south. And uh, what I want to do now I, with our students, I say, let's go stand right there and look back at it and see what would it look like, have looked like uh, 21,000 years ago. So here we are. We're looking at up from this corner here. Here's the railroad track. We're looking to the north. And in your mind, can you picture there would be a tunnel here? And if you don't, do it on your own. I'll help you a little bit. There's the tunnel, the, the, tunnel, the tunnel. Here's the sediment. And that's probably what it looked like somewhat after the glacier left. All right, so what are, uh, there are, you know, Fred Stum has done a lot of work uh, in, the, in Nassau County, and uh, he has, uh, has found quite a few older tunnels, older valleys, which very well could be tunnel valleys. They seem to have the characteristics of a tunnel valley. And here is a, uh, a map. And this is this map is showing the uh, the altitude of the uh, Lloyd Aquifer, and uh, so these are you can see that the the uh, these are indented in, and so these are areas where you could expect that these are tunnels, and he he can show we'll take a look at some of them, and here it's uh, from Cold Spring Harbor to Hempstead Harbor. And you can see now that here's the, here's the upper glacial aquifer. It's very narrow, very thin, very, very thin. And this is the North Shore uh, confining unit. And then here we have the upper glacial aquifer, and here's the North Shore confining unit. But this one is not the glacier. The next, the, the next, the last glacier didn't make this into a tunnel. In this case, now we have at Oyster Bay Harbor a North Shore confining unit. And this one's not as deep. This one, this tunnel is not as deep. And then, uh, and again, a very thin uh, upper glacial. And then here we have another one. And this is about the same size as that. And then we have this one. So these are about the same depth, but this one is much deeper. So one of the questions, that one here is much deeper. So one of the questions are, does this suggest then that the deeper one is older? Uh, not older necessarily, but that it extended further out to the south and uh, and then was or was both longer term could have been there longer term because if that's true also that would also suggest that the 
the, that the, the tunnels that are forming, the tunnel valleys that are forming with the, that we see right now, they didn't, they, this would suggest they weren't, they weren't forming for a very long period of time. They were, uh, they probably occurred in, in quickly by geological standards. And here it is then, uh, Hempstead Harbor to Manhasset. And again, we see, we get, uh, of course, Hempstead is a big one. And uh, here we can see another, another valley that's in there, cutting deep into the, into the uh, basement. And then here we have uh, Little Neck Bay and Manhasset Bay. We're gonna look at this cross section. And in this case, uh, Nino Asset Rastomization Day, Wolfster shows from well N10101 uh, adjacent to this one here, uh, 12465. Oh, it doesn't matter about that one. Indicates an age of about 20, 20 or 25,000 years, which suggests that the Yarmouth age for the brackish shallow marine environment. So that would suggest that the glacier had been further south uh, than this, and it was uh, and it was occurring at not the last uh, glacial uh, minimum, but the the, uh, the 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 one before then. And then here, here then is interesting. Your Little Neck Bay, Manhasset Bay. Uh, we don't see tunnels under here, older tunnels, but here we find two tunnels that are older, uh, tunnel valleys, and then look at here, upper glacial aquifer. So the upper glacial aquifer here is on the Raritan clay and the North Shore confining unit, and this North Shore confining unit is cut by this North Shore confining unit. So we know that the, the, the geology is quite complicated. We know there's multiple geological, multiple, <coughs> multiple times that the glacier came here and left uh, tunnels. And then uh, this is a map by Smolensky and others in uh, 1990. And I put the Harbor Hill Moraine here and uh, it's, it's really loaded with, it, with uh, detail, so I you can't see things unless I, I, I put them out. But he shows a number of uh, uh, valleys that are going to the south. Most of them are going south or are, are, are fairly deep and south. So this is from Flushing, a valley. And if you look at it, the valley actually continues way to the south of that. Now, whether that's a tunnel valley or with this uh, uh, some, uh, uh, or not, uh, I don't know, but we can look at it, consider it. Here's Huntington Station, another one coming far to the south. Uh, here's the Smithtown one coming far to the south. And then Rocky Point going south of the Harbor Hill Marine. And then here in Orient, uh, this one is going way far to the south. You can actually see he's has it extending way out. So we have uh, older older valleys that are are are, are buried older buried valleys uh, that are also here. So the geology is 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 quite complicated uh, because of multiple glaciations. We know it has to be at least two, but maybe more. So harbors are subglacial tunnels that end at front of moraine. These tunnels are narrower and steeper with a, within a few. Uh, harbors are in subglacial tunnels that end at the front of the moraine. These tunnels are narrower and steeper within a few miles of the moraine front because of permafrost. The valleys are straight with few tributaries except for those in the three village Port Jefferson area. 
Some valleys occupy some locations as pre-existing sediment filled valleys, which may be tunnel valleys. So the newer tunnel valleys formed at the same place. I guess they found that it was uh, easier to make a tunnel valley there. One of these older valleys has amino acid racemization ages for oyster shells of 225,000 years before present. Port Jefferson Tunnel Valley occurs alongside the Mount Misery Interlobe Moraine, is relatively shallow and does not appear to be associated with older valleys. It has a large outwash band with more sediment than is available in sediment removed, uh, from, by the, uh, removed from the Port Jefferson Harbor. The source of subglacial water in eastern tunnels may be from subglacial river as well as local glacial melt traveling through the lands to the base of the glacier and then in tunnels. Older deep valleys, older deep valleys may extend south of Long Island. So that's the end. And then if you're traveling along the North Shore Road and you notice there's a valley on the right and the valley on the left, and you might ask yourself why What's the history of this road? And uh, you'll say, oh, well, it's following paths that were paths or trails that were set up by the colonials. And then the next question you ask, why did the colonials travel along this path? And you'd say they were following game trails, right? They wanted to be following the simplest ones. And or by the Indians, I'm sorry, following by the Indians. They would be following the Indians' trails. And why were the Indians following these trails? They were following the trails that the game they were game trails they were following. And and if, if you're following on this road on the North Shore and you're forced to travel at four or five miles an hour. You might want to think as you're traveling, why am I going so slow? And then you may take the larger picture and said, oh, it might be a, a family of, of uh, mammoths ahead, just wandering up the road on their way. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. That was a really awesome an informative presentation. Um, we'd like to open it up to questions now. Yeah. Should I, I, just, I stop share or not? I'll, I'll, I'll leave it share, yeah. If there's anybody that has a question that doesn't have a microphone, please feel free to add it to the chat and we'll read it out loud. Hey, uh, Dr. Hansen, thanks for the presentation. Very informative. I have a question. You, the tributaries that you mentioned that are parallel to, uh, perpendicular to the tunnel valleys, right? Those, those would be subglacial tributaries forming at the same time as the tunnel valleys? Yeah, they're probably forming uh, by groundwater sapping, uh, if, or, or at least the stream sapping. So that the that the uh, water can, can water at the base of the glacier could come out, or or it could be water from the glaciers, from the from the tunnel valley itself or the tunnel itself going out. I don't know which it is, uh, but yeah, there would be uh, there'd be water on that were some glacial as well. In some cases, uh, I mean, I've looked for them. I didn't mention this. Uh, you can tell a tunnel valley from a subaerial valley because uh, a tunnel valley will usually be draped by till. And in a number of cases where I've looked for it uh, in, uh, on the uh, tributaries and, and or in, on the uh, main tunnel, tunnel valleys, you can see the till. And so, yeah, that would suggest they are subglacial. Great, Great. thank you. Hey, uh, Gail, this is uh, Doug Paquette. How are you doing? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I, I'm 
much going to be appreciating uh, when I drive through Port Jefferson next time. <laughs> I appreciate the topography. Okay, good. Anyone else? Uh, this is Tom Warhan in Buffalo. I just want to say thank you. Uh, I used to work down in New York City and have been out uh, and seen uh, firsthand some of the places where you took the pictures. And uh, it never really occurred to me uh, how, how that terrain got the way it was. And, and now I, I've seen it enough and I know now I, I just, it's really been enlightening. Thank you. That's good. Anyone else? All right. Well, that sounds like uh, we're at the end here. Um, Dr. Hanson, I want to say thank you again on behalf of everyone on the call. Um, you did an, a most excellent job framing um, the everyday environment that we see in, in a very different light. Um, and uh, it's really, really fascinating to see, you know, how the technology really enhances, you know, the ability to observe um what what's occurred here and uh and i you know we all want to say thank you so we really appreciate you coming out and you're welcome most excellent um for the group if you want to review this it will be this session has been recorded and it will be posted um and the multimedia tab on the lapg website as are all of our webinars so if you missed one check it out um I am going to disappoint you and say that there is no trivia poll tonight. Um, and that's solely on me for not being able to get it uh, put together in time. So I apologize for that. But um, we look forward to seeing you in 2022 and want to wish everyone um, peaceful and happy holiday season. Stay safe. Stay distant. Do the right thing. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris. See everybody next year. Take care, all. Be well.